So in school, you guys probably learned a lot about biology and then quickly forgot it. So what I wanna do here is give you guys a basic introduction of just the relevant concepts for learning movement. This video is gonna be divided into three parts. So first, we're gonna have some really basic, universal, general things that pretty much everyone should know about their bodies and about movement. Second, we're gonna go into things that are a little more specific to people starting a movement practice. And third, we're gonna actually learn a few movements and just get you guys a little basic taste of a few moves. Terminology can be confusing and boring sometimes, but it can be really useful for helping us communicate. Editor here. So this video is gonna be a fire hose of information because I'm trying to teach you guys all the most important things you probably don't know about your body. We're gonna roll the intro, but I highly recommend that you pause the video and grab a pen and paper so that you can write everything down and really absorb the information. Also, I lied, this series is probably gonna be four videos. The first movement terms to know are just flexion and extension. So flexion is when any joint moves towards fetal position. Extension is when it moves away from fetal position. The only exception to this is the ankles. And that's just because they're both called flexion. Dorsal flexion and plantar flexion. If you think about like a dorsal fin of a fish or a whale or whatever, it's the fin on the back. Dorsal just kind of means back. So if we think about this the same way, dorsal being the back of your foot is gonna be flexion, movement towards the back of the foot. And plantar flexion will be the plantar surface of the foot, the bottom, and where it's gonna be movement towards the plantar surface of the foot. The next one is anterior and posterior pelvic tilt. If you think of your hips as a basin of water, Posterior pelvic tilt means you would be spilling this basin to the back of you, behind you. And anterior pelvic tilt means you would be spilling the basin of water in front of you. For the body movements, we also have abduction with a B and adduction with a D. Sometimes people will call it abduction and adduction. Abduction is movement away from the center line of the body. If you had an alien abduction, you would be taken away from the earth. Abduction moves away from the center line, right? So this would be abduction of the arm. This would be this way, abduction of the leg. And then from here, coming back to the center line is adduction. The forearm has this movement. This is pronation and this is supination. So the way I remember this, supination here, we're holding soup. Hold soup and supination. And pronation is just not holding soup. We also have internal rotation and external rotation. There are four main scapular movements. Elevation, protraction, retraction, and depression. There are just three planes to the body. There are two names for each of them, but we'll just use the easier ones. The frontal plane, that will divide the body in the front and the back, here. the sagittal plane that will cut and divide the sides, left and right. The transverse plane, and that will separate top and bottom. We also have three main types of muscular contractions. Isometric, which means the muscle will contract and stay at the same length. Concentric, which means the muscle will contract and shorten. The muscle is trying to shorten and it's able to shorten. Eccentric contractions, where the muscle is contracting but also lengthening. So the muscle is trying to shorten but it's being lengthened anyway. We also have open kinetic chain and closed kinetic chain movement. So open kinetic chain is fixed center moving endpoints. So imagine a bench press is a great example. The center is fixed, you're laying down, and the endpoints move. You're grabbing the bar and you're pushing the bar away from it. And now the flip side of that, the closed kinetic chain, is the endpoints are fixed and the center moves around it. So imagine that same movement, but instead of moving the endpoints, we're moving the center, that becomes a push-up. Our hands are fixed on the floor, we're moving around it. We also have ipsilateral and contralateral. Ipsilateral just means same side of the body, and contralateral just means opposite side of the body. We can use this to refer to some movements. So, for instance, a jab from boxing would be ipsilateral. So if I had the left leg forward, left shoulder forward, I throw the left arm. Versus a contralateral would be if the left leg is forward, 
I move the right arm. We're gonna do some really basic muscle groups. These guys here are elbow flexors. There are a few other muscles in there, but let's call them the biceps. The flip side of the arm here, these muscles extend the arm. They're the triceps. There are a bunch of muscles in here that will flex the wrist. We'll call them forearm flexors. And a bunch of muscles over here that will extend the wrist. We'll call them forearm extensors or wrist extensors. The shoulder is really easy. We can just divide it into three parts. Front, middle, and back. That's all it is. It's a deltoid, and we have the anterior deltoid in the front, the medial deltoid in the side, and the posterior deltoid in the back. We have traps. So the traps are huge muscle. There's the upper traps, middle traps, and lower traps. But the big ones are the upper traps. And so these are gonna elevate the scapula and move the shoulders higher. And they're also gonna extend the neck. Next, we have the sort of chest muscles. So it's mainly gonna be pec major. And for now, we'll just call these the pecs. It's gonna adduct the, the arm with a D, a deduction. So the last are these big muscles here. They attach up a little below the shoulder right there on the upper arm. And they're gonna mainly be pulling the shoulder down into extension. And so when we do chin-ups and pull-ups, pretty much any of this pulling work, the lats are working quite hard. And so the full name is latissimus dorsi. Actually really easy to remember because it basically just means the widest back muscles. The glutes. So it's a glute complex. And there's a whole bunch of muscles there, but we'll just call them the glutes. Keep it nice and easy. Most of them do a similar motion of hip extension. We have, of course, abs, the rectus abdominis is the full name. And they're just gonna do this spinal flexion here. The opposite to that is the spinal erectors. So they're just gonna extend the spine. So anything posture wise that um, is loading you and pulling you into this flexion. So think of like a deadlift. The spinal erectors are working really hard. There's the transverse abdominis that sort of surrounds all of this. And that's just gonna kind of suck everything in. So if you try to suck in your tummy, you're uh, trying to fit in a shirt that's too small, that's the transverse abdominis. It is very important. It helps with breathing. It's a big important thing. Also, anytime you pressurize, if you're gonna do something hard and you hold your breath, a lot of that is from the transverse abdominis pushing in and creating that pressure for you to stabilize and allow you to transfer force between the lower and upper body. We have the obliques. There's the internal and external obliques. For now, we'll just say the obliques do twisting. Twisting and flexion. Small muscles, but they are fairly important, is the rhomboids. They're sort of between the scapula there, and so they're gonna pull the scapula together. Remember, the scapula is sort of the bone that holds the shoulder. It kind of is the shoulder. So when people talk about the shoulder girdle, the shoulder complex, they're talking about the shoulder and the scapula and actually the AC joint over here. There's the rotator cuff. The rotator cuff is a complex of four muscles. Easy way to remember it is SITS, S-I-T-S, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and teres minor. And these muscles are pretty much gonna do external rotation of the shoulder. So these are really important to help stabilize the shoulder and allow us to do a lot of things, but also to pull things back. They're also very commonly injured, so it's an important group of muscles to work on. Last few things, so on the knees, up in front here is the quads. These guys will extend the knee when they contract here, and we have the hamstring. They will flex the knee and extend the hip. Also, fun fact about the quads, they named the quads because there's four of them, but then just a few years ago, they discovered a fifth one, so now the quads really are a group of five muscles. Next, we just have the uh, calf. They're gonna mainly push into plantar flexion there. The gastroc, or part of the calves, is going to also assist in knee flexion. There's the anterior tibialis and a few other muscles in the front of the shin here, and they will pull you into dorsiflexion there. They'll pull that foot up. And that's it for the muscles. We're living in our bodies our whole lives, right? And so it might seem like a lot of information, but knowing that can be really helpful. There will be times where if something hurts, especially, you wanna know what that muscle does. Knowing what that muscle does or knowing what the muscles around that area do can help you design what you're gonna do to fix it, to improve it, to strengthen it. Also, if you have a certain function you need to improve, 
you feel your, your knee extension is weak, it's good to know what muscles do knee extension. Where are those muscles? If you don't know that, you're gonna have a tough time. If there was one rule that's the most important for movement, everything out of all the different disciplines, it's this one thing, is center of mass over base of support for balance. You're only balanced if the vertical projection of your center of mass falls over your base of support. So remember, your base of support is the area bounded by your contacts on the floor, and your center of mass is mathematical construct of the center of where your mass is distributed. So the center of mass doesn't have to be inside your body, but it's always somewhere. If you're not falling, if you're balanced, you need the center of mass within that base of support. It has all sorts of wide ranging implications. So that means if you're fighting someone and you want to trip them, you want them to fall, you want to throw them, you've got to at some point get their center of mass off their base of support. If you're doing Olympic weightlifting and you're doing a squat and at any point your center of mass comes off of your base of support, you're done, you know, you're, you're falling. And if it comes close, you're not even gonna be as stable. It also means for acrobatics, there are certain limitations of the way we can do things because we have to land with our base of support under the center of mass. There are all sorts of things that you will have a hard time with as you're going through a movement practice and beginning a movement practice and understanding this center of mass base of support idea or rule will really help you figure out what's going wrong and how to fix it. The next thing I want you guys to know is talent doesn't exist. As far as I know, genes give us predispositions, okay? So I used to think when I was a kid, the way people talk about genetics is, oh, hey, that guy over there, he has great genetics, so he's good at sports, and hey, you over here, you know, you suck. So <laughs> genetics are terrible. It's not the way it goes, you know? It's, really, it's much more predispositions towards and away from certain things. For instance, I have thalassemia. I'm a thalassemia carrier, which means my red blood cells are about 60% of the normal size. And so growing up, I'm thinking, well, this is just, this just sucks, right? This is just bad genetics. And it means that when I, you know, I'm fine, but when I, we go run a mile in PE, you know, the other kids that maybe didn't work out as much, they're, they're doing pretty well, you know, and I'm, I'm really working there, right? But there's a book by David Epstein called The Sports Gene, and I highly recommend this. And what he says is, again, it's all these predispositions. And so actually, guess what? If you look at sprinters in the Olympics, there is a far higher likelihood than the general population that they're going to have thalassemia. And the reason for this is people with thalassemia tend to have much higher proportion of fast twitch muscle fibers, which for sprinters is a huge advantage. If you're gonna do an endurance sport, it's, a, you know, it's not gonna help you. When I'm running those miles, I certainly feel it. But when we're doing weightlifting, when we're doing sprinting, that was actually a helpful thing. I also thought, you know, I was always growing up, I was like, I wanna be tall, I wanna be tall. And my parents would always tell me, they're like, oh, your dad, he had his growth spurt in high school. You know, like later, later in life, I was like, okay, you know. My dad's like 5'9". I was always like shorter growing up. And so I'm waiting, waiting for high school, I'm gonna grow, you know. And um, I had my growth spurt, it was three inches. I went from 5'3 to 5'6", right? And so I always was thinking that, okay, being shorter is just a disadvantage. You're less good looking and it's just bad for sports, right? Volleyball, no contest. Basketball, no contest. Like, football, it's very hard. What you realize though is it depends on the sport. So it, being shorter gives you a predisposition to certain things. Away from a lot of the more popular sports, sure. But in powerlifting, the greatest powerlifter of all time it's actually 5'6", Ed Cohn, which is actually my exact same height. Gymnast, actually for a gymnast, I would be quite, for an Olympic level gymnast, 
I'm actually quite tall. This is five six is too tall. Most gymnasts you'll see are, are very short. It gives them certain advantages with leverage, right? And if you're taller and you try gymnastics, man, you're gonna have a tough time. We talked about genetics just now, but also a lot of people will, will feel this sort of talent idea. They go to try something new and they have a harder time learning things than other people. Maybe someone else, you, you and your friends, you go try a new sport and your buddy learns it. He's already starting, he's much better than you, and maybe he even learns it faster than you, right? And so you're like, oh shit, like he's, he's talented and I'm not, right? And that was certainly me growing up. What I realized, and I was like so unathletic as a kid. Growing up, I like, I played some sports when I was very little and I was like, no, that's not for me. I don't like that shit, you know, I'm gonna play StarCraft. And then so in high school, I just ended up getting back into sports. I was like, oh, football seems cool, let me try that. And guess what? I was horrible. I worked super hard at it and I worked every day. I was always there, I worked harder than everyone else. And I was terrible, you know? And my coaches, they, they tell me, they're like, you know, that friend kid, he works so hard, but like, he doesn't have a shred of athleticism, poor guy, you know? There's no talent, right? And so I sort of thought this growing up and I started gymnastics in college and it was, it was similar. So then I had a weightlifting background. And so when I started gymnastics, I had a fair amount of strength. Wasn't strong for, you know, high level gymnast standards, but quite strong. And so it, it helped me with a lot of gymnastics. I wasn't coordinated at all. So I still had a really hard time with a lot of things. I wasn't flexible at all. So I still had a very hard time with that, but you know, it wasn't so bad as football maybe. Years later, then I started jujitsu. By that time, I had started training with Ido. I had been doing gymnastics for a while. And so I wasn't anywhere near as coordinated or had the same movement intelligence I have now, but it was far more than back in high school when I started football. And it was at the point where it was also far more than other people who were starting jujitsu. So I still remember it was one day, I was rolling with a guy that was much bigger than me. He's, he's strong and you know, the sort of guy, anyone would call him athletic. And we roll and, and after we finished, he goes up to my coach, he's like, man, Brent is so athletic. I was like, I just remember thinking, I was like, yes, like, yes, like that is so, you know? But it was really funny just because of the contrast between like no athleticism and wow, this kid's super athletic, you know? Was just the training I had done. Outside of that specific sport, the other movement background you have is really important and will give you transfer or not give you transfer. So if you're starting movement practice or you're trying a new sport or new discipline, whatever, the less background you have in movement disciplines, any of them, the harder it will be for you and the more it will feel like you're not talented. The more you do, the more you stick with it, the more you'll start to get things, the more you'll pick things up, the more you'll have physical capacities, You'll have more strength, flexibility, coordination, all this that predispose you to certain sports. Or if you're not predisposed to any sport, then you're kind of predisposed to being good all around. In general, especially with movement, it's really not a genetic thing other than, you know, if you, you have certain diseases, right? This is the harder thing. But if you're healthy, it's not a talent thing, right? The talent is a construct. I've never seen it. What I have seen is people with movement background picking things up faster and people without it struggling like I did. So if that's you right now, you know, don't worry. It's, you're gonna build it, right? That's, that's what we do with a movement practice is we build that talent, that athleticism, that movement intelligence that you wouldn't get if you just go, you know, do some weightlifting, CrossFit, yoga, whatever. Thanks so much for watching the whole video. Let me know what you learned in the comments and have a great day.